All right. Uh, hey, thanks for coming. I'm Mike Barrett. I work at Remind, and uh, really excited to tell you guys a little bit about uh, Empire and how we moved away from Heroku into uh, Amazon ECS. No, it's not working. <laughs> All right. Um, Real quick, what you, what you can expect from this session. I'm gonna start off with a quick introduction, tell you a little bit about Remind, a little bit about the history of why we did this. And then Eric's gonna hop up here and he's gonna do the fun part with all the demos and the, the background uh, design stuff, so it'll be cool. Um, again, this is Eric Holmes, I'm Mike Barrett. That's Eric at his wedding day. That's me with my boy, Archer. Um, we're infrastructure engineers at Remind. We build lots of uh, stuff and we, do, we both do quite a bit of open source, so if you wanna find our stuff, you can find it there. All right, so what's Remind? Remind is a messaging platform for teachers, students, and parents. Um, it makes it really easy for a teacher to send rem reminders to kids about like what, what homework they have or if they're having a, a trip come up, that kind of thing. There's a lot of numbers up here, um, and if you were at the keynote, you saw my boss, Jason, steal the thunder of this slide a little bit. Uh, really, the important number that isn't up here is the one that he, he repeated, 8,300 kids every day in this country drop out, and that's something that Remind's really passionate about fixing. So, give you a little bit of history. Um, back when Remind started, 2011, it was uh, monorail, just a monolithic Ruby on Rails app uh, that did all the web processing, did all the background processing, all that stuff. Eventually, that didn't scale, and that became really apparent during back to school. Back to school's crazy for us. Um, Sure, if you guys have kids, back to school's nuts for you. There's a lot of emotions going on. For us, it's similar, except for we're worried about the servers. Uh, we get about, in the, I think this year in August, when it starts, for about a month and a half, each day we'd get about 400,000 new users. Um, so eventually, when the mono, monolith started to slow down, we started to see it creaking, we broke off our first service. And um, it worked out really well. It worked out really well for us. Uh, so well, in fact, that today we have over 30 different services that all talk to each other. So when we started, we started in Heroku, and Heroku was awesome for us. Uh, let the team really focus on what was important, on building code, getting new features out, you know, getting our users going. Uh, but as we got bigger and as we had all these microservices, it started to, we started to really feel some of the pain from the constraints. Um, one of the big ones is every app you put into Heroku is public, it's out on the internet. Which, when we started going to these microservices, now we have 30 of these things that are out on the internet, which means you have to protect each and every one of them. Um, not, even, not only that, but not only the apps, but the databases that you use in Heroku are public and on the internet. And so you have to secure them with these really long passwords and stuff, which is still good practice anyways, but it just it wasn't a great story for us. Uh, and then finally, the fact that we had very little visibility and control over the hosts and the, the hosts that the, the, the processes ran on and the routing layer was starting to show some pain for us. So um, around that time, we started to talk about, like, well, what are we going to do instead? Like, how are, we gonna do, how are we going to continue to provide the service and still keep all the power and flexibility that we're used to? And uh, this is actually one of the things that really drew me to remind. It's a really cool company. This isn't our core product. Like, there's no reason that we needed to do this necessarily. But it, everyone really saw that there could be benefit to us producing something like Empire and just you, being able to use it. So they gave us the, the, the go ahead to start building it. So what did we want on the platform? First of all, AWS. We'd been using AWS in a lot of, a lot of different places already. Um, so we were super comfortable with it. So it just made sense to put it on there. Uh, second, flexibility. This is going back sort of to the control visibility and flexibility of the hosts and routing layer. We just, we want to be able to see all the way down to the instance what was going on and be able to tune things. Um, we had developed some really good shared patterns of deployment and development while we were in Heroku using 12-factor apps. Um, and we just didn't want to lose that. We didn't want to, you know, have a big hit on our developers' productivity just because we're on a new system. Because Remind has never had an operation or a full-time operations team, we didn't intend to build one, and so that meant that this application had to be able to be ran by the developers themselves with as, as little uh, interference as possible. And then we were also starting to use Docker a little bit internally, and the the ideas in Heroku with your apps are sort of fit into the container idea, so it made sense for us to go ahead and mess with that. But I'm going to go into that a little bit more. So. Reasons we were really into containers. Really fast build and deploy cycle. For us to deploy a service, any given service, takes about one to two minutes 
from the point when we check it into Git to pushing it out there. Um, they make it super easy for you to isolate dependencies, which is great if you want to pack a lot of, of applications on the same host. You can basically, um, you just don't have to worry about them having dependency conflicts. Uh, better th so one of the really cool features, and especially with Empire, I think Eric will show a, 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 the command later, but because of the fact that you're using the same images, you can pull them down and run them on your laptop. And we can actually, with Empire, you can pull down the images and pull down the config and run that locally on your laptop to do development, testing, that kind of thing. Um, immutable images are really awesome. That means that for a given version of, a, of something, we can tear it down, bring it back up, and we know it's exactly the same. We don't have to worry about like, oh, did somebody make a change to this? No, we know for that version, it's always going to be the same. And then because of all these things, we can pack more uh, applications on hosts, and it allows us to better utilize the underlying host resources. And so, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Eric, and he's going to get to the fun part. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we built Empire. So, we started building Empire back in January, and we knew what we wanted, but we still had just a really long road of us to actually build it. So, we had a few main design goals when we started out. So, one of them was that we just wanted it to be really easy to operate. So a lot of the existing uh, solutions in the space that we had run into were just operationally complex to set up or just difficult to actually run. Um, but we wanted something that was gonna have a minimal amount of dependencies and just be re really easy to operate. Uh, we're big proponents of open source at Remind. We open source a lot of things and we're built on top of open source products. So we wanted to try and give back as much as possible. And you know, we knew when we were building this that it wasn't gonna give us we weren't trying to build, we were trying to build something generic. Um, we were trying to solve everybody's problem, kind of. Um, and what we were building wasn't gonna be specific to us, and it wasn't gonna give us any kind of competitive advantage in our personal product space. Um, so we wanted to open source it if we could. And then one of the constraints that we actually really liked about Heroku was a uh, 12 factor application. So all of our services are uh, built on this 12 factor model, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in, in the later slides. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, it's essentially like a set of best practices. Uh, or a methodology for how you should build uh, robust stateless services that you can scale out easily. And then when we started building this, you know, we weren't sure, we, we kind of knew the least, and we weren't sure what we were going to use as the scheduling backend for our Docker containers. So we wanted something, when we built this, we wanted to make the scheduling backend swappable. So uh, you know, we were gonna sp spike into one scheduling backend, and if it didn't work out, we wanted to be able to easy, easily switch between two, and then maybe even uh, further down the line, support different uh, scheduling backends. And then, you know, most importantly, we needed this thing to be like super stable. So we have, you know, 30 million users, and apparently they don't like it when we break things. So, you know, we needed to be able to mi do this migration uh, without any kind of downtime. And then we wanted to use Docker images as a unit of deployment. So when we wanted to deploy a new version of a service, we would just build a new Docker image and then deploy that to the platform. So when we started building Empire, we kind of broke it out into these three main components. So the scheduling component is the component that the platform would talk to you to actually run an application. So ideally, this would be a, either a separate service uh, that we would talk to. Uh, the router, the routing layer uh, would be essentially the layer that would hold service discovery and expose applications that uh, provide HTTP or TCP services to actually communicate with each other. And then the control plane would just be the interface into the platform. So this would be either like a graphical user interface or maybe a CLI. So the scheduling component will generally have some form of cluster management. So uh, this allows machines that come up to just contribute uh, their CPU and memory resources into a pool of machines. And then it would have some form of task placement. So this would provide us with an API to communicate with when we actually want to run something on the cluster of machines. Um, and this allows us to treat our machines as just a pool of resources. So we want, to, we want to run something, it checks CPU and memory, finds a suitable host, runs it on that host. So one of the most important interfaces that we extracted pretty early on inside of Empire uh, was the scheduler interface. And this is what I was talking about with pluggable backends. So we define an app as a collection of processes and the scheduler interface just is a very generic uh, implementation, or sorry, not an implementation, interface for running an application, removing an application, scaling individual process out, processes out horizontally, um, and then retrieving a, a state about the running uh, or pending tasks. So about three months into the project, we had a V1 version of Empire, and it looked like this. 
So for the scheduling layer, we were using CoreOS and Fleet. So if you're not familiar with Fleet, it's essentially a distributed uh, system D that's backed by uh, this uh, component called etcd, which is a cluster manager and a distributed key value store. Um, and then the routing layer, we were using a combination of things. So we were using Nginx, etcd, registrator, and confd. Um, basically, when new Docker containers came up, this component called registrator would listen for events. It would publish a key into etcd. Confd would listen for those changes, update an Nginx configuration. It was super complicated. And that's why we eventually kind of removed this component. Um, and then for whoop, sorry. And then for the control plane, uh, we so all, all of our developers were really familiar with um, the existing tools that we were using. So we we're using Heroku, and we we're using the Heroku CLI. So we basically took the Heroku platform API and treated it as a spec. Um, we really didn't want to change a lot about our actual workflow. We just wanted to change implementation details. Um, so we took the platform API, implemented it inside of Empire, and that allowed us to just use reuse existing tools like the Heroku CLI. So, actually, I should go back. So around the same time, um, we started testing this in staging, and we kind of felt like we weren't getting the stability that we really wanted, and we were kind of just piecing together all these alpha-level components. Um, and we were just a little bit worried about actually putting all these components into production. So around this time, EC2 container service became generally available. Um, so EC2 container service, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's just a it's a, manage, a cluster manager and scheduler for running uh, Docker images, essentially. So the way I generally describe it, it's probably the easiest way to run Docker images on a cluster of machines. Uh, it provides four main resources. Uh, clusters are essentially a, a logical grouping of EC2 instances. Uh, task definitions are basically like templates for what you want to run. So it allows you to specify the container, environment variables, other options to go along with it. Tasks represent just a running instance of a task definition. And then services are one of the most important concepts that we use inside of Empire. And uh, this, is, this allows you to horizontally scale a task definition. So uh, you link a task definition to a service, and it will, services will maintain desired state. So if you want to run five, 10 instances of something, then t services are the way that you want to do that. So if we take a look again at that scheduler interface, we could essentially just map it directly to these ECS API calls, which make it really simple. Um, so running an app, we're just going to register a task definition, create a, an ECS service, or update it in an existing ECS service. Uh, removing an app, just going to delete a service. Scaling processes, we'll just update the desired count. So we spiked into a prototype using ECS as the back end. Um, this was great because it allowed us to it allowed us to remove those existing scheduling components that we had basically built up ourselves and just use AWS services, managed AWS services. So this was services that we wouldn't have to actually run and operate and maintain and monitor ourselves. Um, so we basically told our boss, you know, we're going to throw away three months of work because we really believe that this is like the right thing to do. And you know, fortunately, they were okay with that because uh, we were pretty confident that this would be the most like stable solution for us moving forward. Um, and this is still the architecture that we use inside of Empire today. So today, Empire is a just really easy to run, open source, self-hosted platform for running 12-factor Docker applications. So I want to talk a little bit about 12-factor uh, and how, it's, uh, how Docker and ECS really complements 12-factor uh, applications. If you can architect your applications this way, it's a really good way to do things. So 12-factor describes these 12 main tenants for how you should build services. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but I'll go through some of the most important ones. Um, but basically, it's all these, these components, th things like config, backing services, uh, logging. So the first one that I'll talk about is dependencies. So this one says that we should explicitly declare and isolate our dependencies. So th the great thing about Docker is it makes it really easy to do this. Um, so we have Docker files that allow us to declare the dependencies and build an image from it. Um, so you know, if you have a Ruby application, for example, that might do some image processing, you'll probably depend on image magic, which is a dy dynamic library. And you need, you need to have that dynamic library on whatever server you put that, you run that application. Um, Docker files allow us to just explicitly declare that and then bundle it up in, a, in an image. The next one is build release run. So we should strictly separate our build and run stages. 
So this, this is really great with Docker because we can actually build an image completely isolated from where we actually run it. So I remind, uh, whenever a developer pushes something to GitHub, we build an image from that every single time, and then we tag it with the Git SHA that it was built from. And then when a developer just wants to deploy it, we just combine the Docker image. So they deploy the Git SHA uh, tag, they deploy the Docker image tag with the Git SHA, it gets combined with the current con configuration for the app, and this is what forms a release inside of Empire. And then Empire just hands this off to ECS to actually run. So like Heroku, we support the concept of uh, proc files. So proc files allow you to uh, define the processes, individual named commands that compose your application. So it's not too uncommon if you have uh, like a Ruby or Python application, it might have a web process that has like a, an, maybe an API, and then maybe a worker process that does some background pro processing, maybe pulls things off of a queue. Um, and then when, when you deploy an, a Docker image to uh, Empire, it pulls the image, it extracts the, doc, the proc file from it, and then each one of these proc file entries gets mapped directly to an associated ECS service. And for web processes, so if you define a web process inside the proc file, then uh, Empire will take advantage of the ELB integration inside of ECS, and it will create and attach uh, an internal ELB to that application. And as a form of service discovery, we just create an internal CNAME record and point it at that ELB, so using the app name. So if you deploy an application called API, then it's always available inside of that, um, inside of the VPC using uh, API as the CNAME, as the DNS. Okay, so the next one is concurrency. So this says that we should scale out via the process model. So when we wanna build robust stateless services, we don't wanna rely on any kind of state and we wanna be able to easily scale out and then also be able to scale down. Um, we can do that very easily with Empire. We can just do emp scale web to 10. It's gonna scale it out to 10 instances of that. Um, and all this does is it just tells the ECS service to change its desired count and ECS will eventually fulfill that as long as it has enough resources inside of the pool of machines. Next one is uh, dev prod parity. So this is, this is a, you know, people talk about this a lot, but it's really actually pretty hard to do. Um, and this is that we should try to keep staging development and production as similar as possible. Um, this has been a lot easier for us as we've moved to Docker because the same image that we build and run in production, you know, developers can pull and run on their local host. Um, and it's almost identical to what we're running in production. Um, and we can actually even use, you know, with M if you're using Empire, there's a little bit of Unix magic that you can do here uh, to just pull the environment variables that, you're, that the application is configured with and then get the same kind of configuration. Uh, so the next one is logs. So uh, in 12 factor, we, it says that we should treat logs as event streams. So all of our applications, we just log the standard out. Um, and then we have a daemon on all of the hosts that uh, streams these logs and it puts them into Kinesis for us. Um, so we have a Kinesis stream and this allows us to uh, easily uh, support this emp log command instead of empire, which gives us streaming logs. Um, this is mostly useful for debugging. So if you're in a staging environment, you deploy something, you wanna stream the logs and see what's going on. Uh, this makes it really easy to do that. Uh, so the next one is admin processes. So we should run admin management tasks as one-off processes. So uh, if you have a Ruby Python application, you probably have database migrations, maybe you wanna run a Rails console to do some interactive stuff. Um, this is kinda hard to implement, but we actually implement it inside of Empire. So when you run like, something like emp run migrate, uh, it, it'll actually attach your, your uh, shell to a running container inside of the cluster. And it'll, it'll actually be interactive too, so if you do Rails console, you can do some things inside of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into a little demo. Um, I'll go ahead and show you how to set up an Empire environment, and then um, I'll show you how we just build and deploy a simple Docker application. And hopefully the demo gods are good to us, so we'll see. Okay. Okay, is that, is that okay? Can everybody see that okay? All right. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and tell you the story of a company you may have heard of before, uh, Acme Incorporated. So Acme Inc, it's been around for years, but what you may not know is that they decided to come online today. And even more importantly, they figured that it would be best to, to have us do that for them instead of Empire. So this is a true story, it's a real, this is a real company. 
So they figured all sorts of cool new stuff are coming out today at reInvent, and they, they want us to do it for them. So after we gathered a few requirements, um, it became pretty obvious that while they wanted a web presence, they don't really know what they want to do yet. So I figured we'll just go ahead and make a placeholder for them and deploy it to Empire. So before using Empire, the only thing that we'll need to do is, uh, of course, set up Empire. So we just need to uh, install Empire inside of an ECS cluster, and then we'll need to install the MP CLI. So I'll just show you real quick how we can do that. Okay, so as we said before, Empire is open source. Um, it's available at remind101 slash empire. So to set up Empire, we provide a CloudFormation stack. Um, this CloudFormation stack is it's mostly suitable for a demo. Um, if you were running Empire in a production environment, you'd probably want to build your own CloudFormation stack and make some, a couple of changes to it. Um, but this is a really good way just to try it out. So when you launch the CloudFormation UI, it'll give you a couple of parameters, things like Docker username, email if you're pulling uh, private Docker images. Um, you can provide those here. Most of these you can actually just leave blank. Uh, the only one that's required is a key name. This allows us to access into the host. Um, in a production environment, you wouldn't want to do this. You'd want it like a bastion host or something, but this is okay for a demo. And then you'll just click Next, and then we'll create the CloudFormation stack. So this will take about 10 minutes. Um, I'm not going to do it now just because it takes so long. So I have a, a pre-existing Empire environment that I'm going to go ahead and use. So the next thing that we need to do is just install the Empire CLI. So the Empire CLI is called EMP, and it's available at remind one slash EMP. And if you have a working Go environment, it's really easy to install. We actually provide binaries as well, um, but we can just type go get remind101 slash emp, and this will install the MCLI. And then the next thing that we'll need to do is just tell the MCLI where our Empire environment is located. So in the CloudFormation stack, I have an Empire ELB DNS name. So this is the location for the Empire API that we have now. Empire API URL. So I'm just going to set this Empire API URL, and this will tell the Empire CLI where to actually communicate with the Empire API. Okay. So now that we have Empire's all set up, we can just run emp apps to see what we're running. So right now we have no applications inside of our Empire environment. It's just a bare Empire uh, cluster, so we can um, start running some applications for Acme Inc. And we can actually verify this too by looking in the EC, uh, ECS console. If I go to the, this is our ECS cluster that was created with that CloudFormation stack. And you'll see right now, we have one ECS service. So this is the ECS service for the Empire API. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, deploy a placeholder site for Acme Inc. Uh, it's pretty simple. I already built it beforehand. So I'm already in it, let me see here. All right, so it's very simple. Um, we just want to give them a standard, you know, HTML website. It's just some standard uh, plain text HTML. Uh, welcome to the home of Acme Inc. Very simple, very simple. My design skills are not good too, so it doesn't look very good, but it's very simple. All right, so the next thing that we'll need to do is just build a Docker file. So it's, since it's just some static HTML, uh, we're just gonna, Use Nginx. So I'm just going to serve it with Nginx. Uh, this is a Docker file for it. It's just going to build from this, the official Nginx Docker image. Uh, it's just going to copy some Nginx configuration file, the uh, HTML file that we created, and then it's just going to run Nginx when we run this Docker image. And if you look at the if you look at the Nginx configuration, also pretty simple. Uh, just sets up a server block that's just going to so just gonna uh, just gonna um, serve the HTML file. So we can build this really easily. Docker build. So like we said before, 
great thing about Docker images is they build really fast as long as you have a pre-existing layer cache, which is important. And let me just go ahead and run it just to make sure that it actually works. Okay, so it's working, Docker image. So it's working in local development machine. We wanna go ahead and deploy this to Empire. So the, the way we do that is by, the only prerequisite to deploy something to Empire is you just have to host it on Docker registry. Um, so all we have to do is push this image to the Docker registry and then we'll just deploy it to Empire. So let me go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and push the image that we just built. This might take hopefully not too long. I think most of the, the layers are already cached, so um, if you're not familiar with Docker, it uses a, basically like a layered system. So uh, a single, oh no. Docker, the demo gods are not good today. Uh, this might be a good reason to not use the official Docker registry and use the new one that they just announced. <laughs> So the Docker registry doesn't have super high availability, but it looks like it's working now. So it shouldn't take too long because all of the, I already pushed this beforehand, so all of the layers are pretty much already cached on the Docker registry. So while that's pushing, actually, I can just go ahead and I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new application. I'm gonna call it www inside of the Empire environment. So this will create an application inside of Empire. And then what I wanna do is I wanna expose this publicly to the internet. So by default, um, if your Empire service uh, exposes a web process, it's gonna create an internal ELB for it, and it's only gonna be accessible with inside of the VPC. But that's not super useful for us. So we can actually expose it publicly by just adding a domain to it. So if I just add a domain, and domain doesn't actually matter right now, I'm just gonna add the domain to it, and this will tell Empire to expose this application publicly. And let me see, I think that image is probably done pushing. So now all we have to do is just deploy it. Should be pretty fast, okay. So that, what that did is it pulled the Docker image, it extracted the proc file from it, tried to extract a proc file. This app doesn't define a proc file, so it uses the default command from the Docker file. And then since it's a, a defaults to a web process, it created an ELB for it, and that ELB is public. So within a couple of minutes or so, this uh, application should be publicly accessible. We can use the MPS command to look at what's actually running. So we're running one web process. So this should be accessible. Let me go ahead and grab the ELB and then we'll try and hit it and see if it works. Let's see, ELB. Oh, EC2, yeah. Actually, I want to go to the ECS service. Okay. So we'll see now inside of ECS. We have an additional ECS service. Uh, you see it's a UUID and then dash dash web. Uh, what this is is the app ID inside of Empire. Web specifies that it's for the, web, the ECS service is for the web process. And we can look into this and we'll see the ELB that was attached to it. And I'll just grab the location for the ELB. A little small, sorry. Okay, so it's working. It's pretty easy, pretty quick, okay. So it looks like I made a typo though. Um, I called them Akamink. CEO is probably not super happy about that. So let me just go ahead and fix that typo real quick and then I'll redeploy. So I'll just make it and push it. Make push. 
So a great thing about Docker is the quick you know, build and iteration cycle. So um, since we already have things cached, we just have to build it. Build pretty quick. You saw that built you know, a matter of seconds. Most of our services do. Um, and then pushing as long as you have, as long as you're, you have an existing layer cache, uh, pushing generally takes you know, 10, 20 seconds. Should finish. OK. And then I'll just deploy the new image. So one of the really cool things about ECS is that when we deploy new versions of things, uh, it's going to do a rolling upgrade. So if we look at MPS again, we see that we're still running the V1 version. So we just deployed a new version, and we're not running it for some reason. And this is because we told ECS to run this new version, but it's, it's, um, it's not consistent. So it's, it's going to basically spin up new versions of the V2 version. And then it's going to wait for connections to drain from the old version. And then it's going to bring down those existing processes. So we'll get zero downtime. We won't lose any connections or any requests during that time. So let me look at it again. So now you can see now we have a V2 version running. And V1 still up. It's probably still serving requests. If I hit this application, I might even go back and forth between Acme Inc. and Acme Inc. Maybe. There we go. So Acme Inc. If I hit it again, it might be Acme Inc. Maybe not. So it looks like we're almost switched over. OK. So one of the cool things, too, is that every time we deploy a new version of something, it creates a new release. So we have two versions of the www application. And we can easily roll back to V1 version if we broke something. Simple operation. And we can also configure. So one of the other things about 12-factor applications is that we should configure via environment variables. So we support all that inside of Empire via emp set and emp env. So if we had some environment variable that we needed, maybe a, a, like a Rails environment, we can easily set that. And then look at the environment. And every time we also deploy, so when we deploy or set environment variables, it'll create a new release. So now we should have four. We should have four releases, one for the rollback, and then one where we set the configuration. OK, so hopefully this gives you a good idea of how Empire can be used and uh, how easy it is to just uh, use it to build you know, stateless 12-factor applications. If you have a lot of services, a microservice architecture, uh, it's a really great, 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 great way to run those. So I'd like to go ahead and jump into a couple more slides about Uh, so we've been using Docker in production now for about five months, um, all through Empire and ECS. Um, and we have discovered a few things. We've learned a few pain points. And um, I'd like to share a couple of those with you. So the first one is container instance rollout. Um, so when you're running ECS or uh, just containers in general, your actual hosts become just a pool of resources. So you, don't, you generally don't put very much on them. Um, just some base stuff. Like for us, it's Docker, the ECS agent, um, StatsD, and some logging infrastructure. Um, so this means that when we want to when we want to deploy a new version of it, we we really embrace immutability, and we don't we don't ever make any changes to our base hosts. We build a new AMI, and then we deploy that to our cluster. Um, when we want to roll out that new version of the AMI, it's a little challenging because what you have to do is you have to bring down an existing host that has ECS services running, make sure that they're, uh, they get spun up on a different host, and then continue that process throughout the entire ECS cluster. So if you're running a fairly large ECS cluster, we run about 36 hosts right now. Um, that can take a long time if you, if you want to do it safely. Um, for us, it takes a couple hours. So just something to be aware of. Next one is logging. Um, unfortunately, logging in Docker it leaves a little bit to be desired right now. For us, um, we use a combination of Logspout and Sumo Logic. So uh, on all of the uh, EC2 container instances that we run, 
we run Logspout, which connects to the Docker daemon and streams all of the, the logs from all of the containers to a SEMA logic agent. Um, and that forwards it along to SEMA logic where we do all of our log aggreg aggregation. When you're running a lot of containers like we are in production, um, it gets kind of challenging to know where those uh, log lines actually originated from. Um, so we get around this by using this source environment variable which gets set inside of Empire. And this includes, uh, it's a single string that includes the app name, the process type that's running, and the version, the release version of the application. Um, and we use this, we set this as syslog structured data in all of our log lines, and this makes it really easy for us to filter out, uh, filter for logs in, uh, in SEMA logic. So the next one, thing to be aware of is Docker is, Docker is a big monolith, so it's a daemon. It runs all of your containers as a daemon. Um, if it panics or crashes, your containers are gonna go down. Um, that kind of sucks, but fortunately, things like ECS that manage desired state um, shield us a lot from any kind of instability that could be there. Uh, so if, you know, if the Docker daemon does go down on your host, uh, ECS is gonna know about it, and it's gonna, it's gonna take those existing tasks, put them on a healthy host, and uh, you'll be all good. Uh, when we first started using Docker, um, about three or four months ago, um, we discovered pretty early on that our build and deploy cycle wasn't as fast as we would like it to be. So in older versions of Docker, we were actually, at the time, we were building our Docker images in CI, and we were using uh, Docker 1.4, I think, at the time, um, which had a, a number of bugs that make it uh, not super fast for building and pushing. Um, and so eventually what we did is we, uh, we broke out this project called Conveyor, and this is our new build pipeline. And this is uh, a build system for Docker images, and it's also open source, a build system for Docker images um, that uses the layer cache efficiently. So it's very integrated with GitHub, um, and it will build Docker images significantly faster than any other build system that I've seen so far. So if you, if you run into problems about building Docker images really quickly, take a look at Conveyor. We just open sourced it recently. And then lastly, the space moves really fast. I mean, containerization is really big right now. I mean, we're basically standing on the shoulders of giants. Tools like Docker, uh, services like ECS um, have really given us the tools that we, can't, that we can use to actually build a platform like this. If we tried to do this two years ago, people would have thought we were crazy. And people probably thought we were crazy when we started anyways. But um, you know, we're, we've been really consistently impressed with AWS's offerings and just the overall stability of ECS. We've been running um, all of Remind inside of ECS now for, I guess, four or five months, probably five months. Um, and it's been super stable. Um, <clears throat> so we're really happy with it. And so that's the end. Um, and I'll just go ahead and open up for any questions, if anybody has any questions. Thank you. <laughs>